Hey folks, welcome back. Breakfast with the coach. Sunday breakfast with the coach. So I'm trying a new apparatus here, so I'm not sure how it's working. Uh, by all means, please let me know when you're on board and let me know how the picture is. I just got a new phone and I've never owned a phone before. So uh, let's see how this is all unfolding. So um, I see some people are gathering. Uh, might be take me a little bit longer, folks, to uh, get to the comment section. Like I said, it's a, a little bit new for me having this phone here. So um, hopefully I'll be able to, uh, you know, uh, get to the comments. Um, it looks simple enough, but, you know, a new toy that I don't know much about. So um, waiting for you. Oh, thank you. Um, people coming on board. All right. Crystal clear. Good. Picture's good. That's why I bought this new device. There was uh, feedback from uh, you guys in the past that the picture wasn't as top quality as uh, maybe could be or should be. And uh, so we took that seriously and I went out and bought myself a phone for the first time in my life. So uh, I have no cell on it, just strictly for the picture, um, for posting to YouTube and my Facebook Lives. And uh, now that I have this little creature, I will probably do more uh, videos um since people seem to enjoy that so uh yeah i'm just waiting for the audience to build and as usual we'll probably have lots to talk about so uh hopefully you guys didn't miss me too much and we'll get back to sunday breakfast with the coach uh, i got lots to talk to you about so i'm just gonna wait to build an audience which seems to be building pretty quick um so if you're out there, throw some thumbs and hearts across the screen. Apparently Facebook likes that. Uh, believe me, my ego doesn't require it. But um, Facebook's algorithms uh, respond to this stuff apparently. And there's uh, some shenanigans going on with Facebook lately um, that aren't very nice. So uh, we have to use all the tricks of the trade uh, to get going. So um, getting some people on board, which is great. Uh, hopefully my picture is straight. And uh, you guys are seeing me okay. Um, yep, Sunday sessions are alive and well. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate that comment, Andrea. Hopefully there's not too too much space between my noggin and the roof. Apparently I'm supposed to uh, um, have that. Is that too close, folks? Is that like, whoa. Um, you know, is that too, too shocking? Having, you know, uh, objects in your screen are much younger than they appear. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I'll get to your questions and answers. We're just building, <laughs> appreciate all the hearts, folks. I'm just building up, um, building up, uh, our audience. So, uh, it looks to be building pretty quick. So I, I might just, uh, uh, get going. Uh, and, uh, yeah, appreciate, um, all the comments, you know, still trying to hang in there, hanging and banging at, uh, age, uh, 56 approaching quickly. So, um, so yeah, I want to get to a few things. Um, once again, uh, we see, um, well, you say I'm still looking good, but I'd trade that to be good looking. So <laughs> you got to look good if you can't be good looking, Andrea. So that's my, uh, that's been my motto for decades. So that's what's kept me going. So um, yeah, uh, I keep, uh, I like to keep that going. So um, anyway, um, <clears throat> I got some stuff. It seemed like while I was away, there was a lot of activity. Seems to always happen. And one of the things that came across my desk uh, was, once again, where true and real academia debunks uh, marketing mythology. Unfortunately, marketing mythology tends to rule on the internet and especially in the fitness industry. <clears throat> but once again, um, real academia, real research, um, counteracts marketing mythology. Something I said in a few of my books, including, uh, I think, Beyond Metabolism and Understanding Metabolism, where I talked about um, gluten intolerance and gluten-free being uh, a, mar a made-up marketing thing in order to capitalize, again, on making people afraid of something they don't need to be afraid of. So uh, here's a study from Harvard. I will post the link in the notes when I'm done, I'll, <clears throat> I'll post it near the top <clears throat> and uh, you guys can read for yourself. But I did make some highlights of this and it's very important that you understand this because there's a lot of hype out there that people take as fact 
And uh, one piece of research is not fact in this industry. We don't deal with hard facts. We deal with soft facts. So here's the headline. Uh, for healthy hearts, gluten-free diets don't help people who don't have celiac disease. Um, that should go right from the top. Um, people with celiac disease do have a risk, a uh, higher risk of heart issues. But if you don't have celiac disease, this notion of being gluten intolerant is a made-up marketing term in order. I mean, I was just at the grocery store yesterday, and lo and behold, there's a whole gluten-free bakery section, gluten-free chocolate chip cookies and gluten-free cake and, <clears throat> and yada, yada, yada. So it works for marketing, but it's just not necessarily true. And in my books, before all the research came out, uh, there was a number of people sort of uh, attacking my opinion on that. So let me uh, read, okay? Gluten-free diet shouldn't be promoted to prevent heart disease among people without celiac disease. Gastroenterologists say after a large U.S. study. The food industry has stimulated popularity in gluten-free diets. True that. Recognizing the public interest, I should say the public gullibility, um, researchers at Harvard Medical School said they wanted to see whether avoiding gluten actually has health benefits for those who don't have celiac. So again, um, researchers at Harvard Medical School, you think that might be a little bit reliable, folks? To that end, Dr. Andrew Chan, you can look him up if you want, Associate Professor of Medicine at Harvard and his team used diet and health outcome data collected from, listen to this, 110,000 health professionals over 26 years to link estimates of gluten in the diet to diagnosis of coronary heart disease. Uh, can we establish that that would be something reputable? First of all, um, Harvard Medicine doing a study of 110,000 health professionals over 26 years. Can we establish that that's real research? All right. So, the finding, big capital letters, <clears throat> no difference, all right? Pause for effect, no difference, all right? Based on the answers to diet questionnaires, the researchers divided participants into five groups of estimated gluten consumption. Gluten, a mix of two proteins, gives dough its elastic texture, blah, blah, blah. Here's the, here's the finding. There was actually no absolute difference in risk of heart disease in individuals according to their gluten intake. Pause for effect. Let me reread that. Absolutely no difference in risk of heart disease in individuals according to their gluten intake. Uh, Chan, a gastroenterologist who treats patients with celiac disease, said in an interview. In fact, now listen to this, please. In those individuals that actually had low gluten intake, they actually tend to have diets that were also low in whole grains, and so they subsequently, because of that, had a somewhat higher risk of developing heart disease. Can I reread that again, folks? How a low gluten intake can actually increase the risk of developing heart disease? Are you catching on to marketing mythology versus actual, real, academic study? All right, let me read that again. And a gastroenterologist, if you want to know something, go to the sources who study it for a living, all right? In fact, Dr. Chan said, in those individuals that actually had low intakes of gluten, they also tended to have diets that were therefore also low in whole grains and therefore subsequently because of that also had a somewhat higher risk of developing heart disease. And uh, in the current issue of the British Medical Journal, also a reputable uh, periodical, the researchers uh, tried to disentangle the effects of higher intake of whole grains that are associated um, um, with lower risks of heart disease from gluten. So, the next headline, whole grain limit. And yes, I will post this link uh, post-breakfast post, uh, session, folks. Uh, quote, for individuals that are looking at a, at, at a gluten-free diet as a potential factor to consider, there is no, really no evidence that restricting the amount of gluten you take in actually has benefits for your heart. And there is also this possibility that if you are overly restrictive in your intake of gluten, that you may also be limiting your intake of whole grains, which can actually cause harm. Do I need to read that again, folks? All right. So, again, buying into industry marketing myths isn't science, isn't research. All right. So, once again, what we see is academia has to respond to a bunch of marketing nonsense by actually studying it. So, 
to continue. While gluten-free diets are sometimes promoted for weight loss, hell, we know all about that in this industry, eliminating gluten can cause weight gain if an individual substitutes gluten-free items that are that are high in fat, sugar, and calories, said Shelly Case, a registered dietitian in Regina. Here we go again. While gluten-free diets all right, are sometimes promoted for weight loss, eliminating gluten can lead to weight gain if an individual substitutes gluten-free uh, gluten items that are high in fat, sugar, and calories, uh, said Shelly Case, a registered dietitian in Regina. And I have tons of personal anecdotes on that kind of stupidity. Going gluten-free is not a magic bullet for losing weight and improving your health for individuals who do not have celiac disease, Case said. I'm going to reread again because i got to thump people with the same message in order to counteract the bullcrap um, in marketing that passes for uh, suggestive imprints in the brain of the consumer. Listen again. Going gluten-free is not a magic bullet for losing weight and improving your health for individuals who do not have celiac disease. <sighs> Some may lose weight or feel better on a gluten-free diet. Now, this is important because of a cause, cause and effect factors, okay? Some may lose weight or feel better on a gluten-free diet, not from the elimination of gluten, she said, but because they've replaced calorie-laden items with more nutritious things like fruits and vegetables and lean protein foods, and they ended a reliance on processed packaged foods. So it's not the magic of eliminating gluten. It's the fact that Having that in your head led to uh, more healthy whole food uh, selections. So going gluten-free wasn't the health benefit. It was, it was choosing healthier foods that was the health benefit. Duh. <clears throat> now, the new findings aren't likely to end the debate, Case said. Here's, here's what's key for me. Um, Hollywood celebrities, athletes, personal trainers, and others will continue to tout the benefits of the gluten-free diet for those who do not have celiac disease, all right? And this is where the problem can, this is how industry works, folks, okay? Industry capitalizes on creating dogma for marketing purposes, all right? So listen, a celebrity source is not the same as a, a reliable resource, okay? Consumers continue to confuse sources as reliable resources, all right? And uh, listen, a celebrity source is not, not, not the same as a reliable resource. Neither is your personal trainer in the gym um, and other Google search surfers, okay? Those aren't reliable sources. Those are just sources, all right? So there's a difference. So the sum total, once again, pure academia debunks heavy marketing um, weight in promoting things that don't need to be promoted and don't really have an effect. So once again, we see something I was attacked for saying in a few of my earlier books, Beyond Metabolism and Understanding Metabolism, that gluten intolerance is an overblown bunch of hype. All right, And if you don't have celiac disease, there really is no such thing as gluten intolerance. And thinking there is can actually lead to ill health and weight gain. Booyah! All right? Same thing with with catchphrases in this fitness industry like carb intolerant. Ooh, I'm carb intolerant. No, you're not. You're afraid of starches. That's, that's the buy all end all. So um, that's my rant on that. And I will post that study for you guys to read. Um, I will post where I found it, which is CBC News, um, sent to me by my protege, Andy Sinclair, while I was on vacation. Um, but listen, um, you know, there's other things to go to from there. So I will post that. So... Again, when you see marketing for something being gluten-free, just sort of shrug your shoulders, shake your head, and especially if you hear someone going on about it. I mean, I told this story before. I was in an airport last year in Calgary Airport, sitting at a restaurant, and a great big overweight lady sat down and wanted to make sure everyone knew that she was on a gluten-free diet, and she had to have a gluten-free menu, and... Of course, they just happen to have one, and that's where the marketing thing keeps putting imprints in people's brains. So she couldn't have gluten at all, but she ordered a, a vanilla shake, and then she ordered a bacon-wrapped uh, scallops and a Caesar salad. Um, so, you know, boggles the mind how people think um, that those choices are, are healthy compared to a healthy whole grain. So, uh, um, you know, 
if you benefited from what I just read, folks, if you get what I'm trying to tell you um, to avoid what looks like science, which is actually heavy marketing crap, uh, then throw some thumbs across the screen. I hate thinking that I'm talking to myself. Um, but yeah, so I had to present that and I will post the study um, in the notes uh, when we're through. So that's just one thing I had to get across, folks. So um, I hope you benefit from that. Please start spreading the word about gluten-free nonsense. Gluten intolerance is a made-up industry word to capitalize on those who suffer from celiac and to once again make people afraid of food, all right? So healthy whole grains is the way to go um, for uh, protective heart health, digestive health, uh, fiber intake, uh, things like that. So, um, you know... Stop buying into industry nonsense that wants you to make wants to make you afraid of more and more stuff. All right, it's not natural for our minds to have evolved to be afraid of food. We're the only animal, we're the only mammal species on the planet that fears our own food supply. Does that make any sense? The most intelligent species on the planet is also the most tormented by our own food supply. That makes no sense at all. If you really want to be fitness in the spirit of fitness then you should be a foodie you should love and enjoy and appreciate all foods even the hyper palatable ones that you can enjoy on occasion so that's my rant about that um and hopefully we will uh we will get beyond that i appreciate the um the hearts and everything and yes i am back and uh hopefully that benefited you guys uh immensely and now that i have this little phone like i said i will be uh able to um, read more things from my screen and, and rather than trying to just to present um, you know um, just to present conclusions so that study I will post get to some of your questions um, coach is it a myth that leg press machines and hack squats protect the knee joint and they are a reasonable tool for the platinum lifter platinum being a term I use, Platinum Club members, physique after 50, people, old farts like myself. Um, I think it's, there's a, a little bit of both there. There's a little bit of truth and a little bit of fallacy in that it's the technique employed that matters. Um, too often, again, this industry is being far too informed by people that come from the strength world and they have a, what we call a paradigm bias, all right? Um, if it was true that lifting more led to better physiques, then we wouldn't even have a sport of bodybuilding because all the power lifters and weightlifters would look better than the bodybuilders, and that we know just isn't true. So uh, there's a bit of paradigm blindness there. So it depends, how, James, how those uh, exercises are performed, leg press and hack squats. If you're bouncing weight out of the pocket in a hack squat, um, then you're doing damage to the knee joint. Uh, if you're not having a smooth and controlled execution of the movement, regardless of the load, um, if you're not going down far enough in order to um, uh, cause uh, maximum fiber recruitment, then that's going to be an issue as well. So um, I think platinum lifters can still be squatting. They just don't want to do a lot of back squats. Uh, you want to, over 50, you want to eliminate unnecessary lower lumbar strain and joint strain on the shoulders, hips, etc., things like that. So... Uh, Andre, appreciate the comment. Hopefully you'll get me on that podcast you referred referred to um, a while back. Can't even remember what it was. But uh, yeah, we need to start getting some some truth out there. So um... <laughs> Laura, thank you. I thought you were going after me there for a second. So uh, yeah, I, I try to um, bring what I know to the game, uh, Laura, as well as when I can back it up with research that's that's pure and makes sense, then I will. Uh, for instance, people don't know this, but a few weeks ago, um, I had some research sent to me that backed up a lot, of, a couple of key points that I make in, in some of my arguments, but I couldn't use it because the research wasn't very good. So, um, you know, when I was doing my master's degree, I had to take a course in what they call method and critical theory um, and stats, and uh, it, it was um, a course that I hated at the time, but it taught me um, how to look at research um, and how to tell bogus research from the real thing. So, um, so yeah, I try to bring research that I think is relevant and true uh, in order to uh, create and form an argument. So after this, though, watch. When I post this, 
people, when I post this to YouTube, there will inevitably be the people that tell me that I don't know what I'm talking about with gluten and blah, 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 blah. Well, you know, here was 110,000 professionals over 26 years that say it's a fallacy. So, you know what? It's a fallacy. Um, Tracy Lynn, I have more than doubled my starch carb intake and your IBS has completely gone away. Well, there you go. Um, stick to whole foods, oatmeal, rice, potatoes, all kinds. Yeah. Yeah, and ironically, too many veggies are the cause. See, this is another problem Tracy Lynn just uh, alluded to. People who who are suddenly convinced that they're carb intolerant. Usually that just means fierce starches. So they load up on veggies, particularly cruciferous veggies. And what does that do? Causes all kinds of gastrointestinal um, um, issues, distension, bloating, cramping, uh, diarrhea. Oh, but I'm eating healthy. Yeah, but you're not eating right because you're not including the things that actually will uh, do good for the digestive tract. Um, so here we go again, you know, that kind of um, institution of thinking. I mean, I remember um, people back in the competition days were following crazy low-carb diets, not in, my, not, not in my people, and they were eating 9 to 15 pounds of veggies a day and wondering why they were having so much uh, gastrointestinal issues. Well, listen, uh, go to my blog. Look, look in the archives under the blog called The Shitter. And you'll read a story uh, I told all about that. So, um, yeah, this, this fear of starches makes no sense. Um, is that Frederick Douglass behind me? Actually, it, um, it's his quote, but that's not, I don't think that's him. Uh, but it is his uh, quote that someone sent to me. Good eyes there, James. Um, best, device, best advice to women over 50 and weightlifting. Um, not for power, but for muscle development. <clears throat> Uh, Brenda, I have my book, Physique After 50. Uh, you might want to read that. Um, it's about the things we can and can't do over 50 and the things we have to accept over 50, that there are tremendous changes and disruptions in our endocrine and biochemical systems that we have to um, accept. You know, you, you can't battle them and change them. They, they're happening. Um, at 56, I mean, I've got from from years of outperforming my body previously, like many athletes, I've got advanced osteoarthritis in my shoulders, which prevents full range of motion for some movements, but the movements still offer relief. So um, you should also, um, I'm a big believer in hormone replacement therapy, so you should look into that as well, Brenda. And if you are over 50, um, especially in the smaller cities or pockets <clears throat> where the doctors aren't as educated um, in terms of hormone replacement uh, therapy for women, uh, testosterone is now showing showing huge benefits. Uh, testosterone as part of um, female hormone replacement therapy is showing huge benefits, but you have to get uh, an endocrinologist or an internal medicine specialist that's kind of up on the latest um, in order to uh, even broach, broach the topic. But um, those are things you can consider, Brenda. You don't want to do a whole lot of barbell stuff. And it's funny, I was just um, uh, filming my YouTube last week and sure enough, on the right of YouTube, down the right where you see all these associated videos, once again, we have a strength guy advocating don't lift heavy dumbbells over 50, whereas, of course, my book, Physique After 50, advocates the exact opposite. Well, first of all, this guy isn't over 50, and second, he comes from the strength world. So once again, we see blinders, what I call paradigm blindness, um, where they're not open, open to the actual looking at the principles and looking at what happens inside the human body post age 50 so um so that was good i appreciate that question brenda and hopefully that helped you uh marcus hey coach no combining starches and fruit in one meal does it apply when bulking no bulking is bulking i don't care what you do for bulking um no bulking is never an excuse to have breakfast at dunkin donuts lunch at wendy's and dinner at mcdonald's that's not bulking that's stupidity um, but when you're bulking, um, by all means, make those combinations. But um, in general, and I have found, and I, I don't have a whole lot of research on this. This is just where four decades of experience comes in, folks. But um, I found that if you don't combine, usually, um, uh, starches with fruit in the same meal, you get a better cosmetic result. So, for instance, my breakfast, egg whites and oatmeal, 
I wouldn't put blueberries or strawberries or anything in my oatmeal. And my next meal where I have just nuts and fruit, I eat as much fresh fruit as I can handle. Um, as a matter of fact, one day my housekeeper said, how can you eat all that much fruit? And I was like, well, I eat till I'm satiated. Um, biofeedback. Um, but I wouldn't add a starch to that. So you can see how that kind of works. Now, um, starch and fibrous veggies, they go together well in terms of cosmetic advantage. So um, that's another good question. Um, Mattis, I think you've read some of my books uh, because of most people wouldn't ask that question because that's specifically in, in my books. Um, so hopefully that helps. Um, Brenda, okay, so you're a new follower. Okay, so you probably didn't know about Physique After 50. And its follow-up book, Brenda, is called The Aging Proposition. Physique After 50 is sort of about uh, training after 50 and what I believe um, um, training should uh, be composed of if you're over 50. Um, and then The Aging Proposition is more how to live from the inside out after 50. Um, you know, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. So they're, at one time, those two books were one and two on Amazon, which made me uh, very proud that, you know, I was helping people and still get reviews, good reviews on that. So what about having fruit in a salad? Yeah, it's it's kind of, um, that's a good question as well. It, I think it's mostly the fruit with starches that has, uh, I wouldn't say it has a negative cosmetic impact, uh, it has a neutral cosmetic impact. But if you want just constant positive cosmetic impacts then the right food combining makes sense um for instance a person wrote me the other day for a one-time diet one well, of my favorite carbs are are bread and pasta well guess what you'll never see a bodybuilder who's dieting to get on stage eating bread and pasta they're just not cosmetically friendly foods so um after training people to peak for a stage for four decades uh, you come to learn things that aren't in nutrition books, and that's the uh, ex that's where expertise comes from by being on the front lines. To have to peak so many different physiques, male, female, young, middle-aged, old, and the difference between winning and second place is peaking someone for the stage within 12 to 24 hours of someone else, you become pretty adept at reading the signs of biofeedback and things you're never going to find in nutrition books. So um, this is why I laugh when people think they can study their way to expertise. You know, there's a, I always say when I'm explaining this about coaching, there's a reason you don't find professional hockey coaches from Saudi Arabia. All right. If you're not immersed in something, you can't be an expert in it, no matter how many books you read about it. So um, there we go again. Another thing that told me from the beginning that this whole gluten intolerance was overblown nonsense, and now the research is catching up to that. So, um, oh, you guys, you're coming in fast and furious. So let me just back up a bit. Um, Ashley, what's the best pre or pro? Oh, sorry, what's the best pre pre workout meal so you can get enough carbs but don't feel heavy during the workout? That's just all about meal timing, Ashley. There's no magic. Bullets, some people can train on an empty stomach, some can't, some have sensitive stomachs, some don't. Um, but we, we need in this industry to get rid of this nonsense of pre, peri, and post-workout nutrition like there's some kind of magic there. As I wrote in most of my books, Permanent Weight Loss uh, and Beyond Metabolism, it's your meal balance throughout the day that matters far more than these incidental things. Yes, if you're a professional athlete working at max work capacity against other professional athletes as a career, then these things matter a little bit. But if you're not, if you're just someone trying to establish weight loss and physique transformation, this whole pre-workout and post-workout and peri-workout stuff is much ado about nothing. It's calories balanced through the day and then over the week that matter far more. Big picture matters more than little picture. Like I always say, we see more with a telescope than we do with a microscope. All right, so hopefully uh, that helps. Good question, Ashley. Good question. Um, Andrea, so, uh, someone asked a long time ago, an obsessive macro counter who loves counting calories and macros makes them happy physically and mentally. Can they do the cycle diet that way? They can do the cycle diet that way, sure. Um, I'm, uh, eh. And anyone who says they love tracking their calories and carbohydrates, I would question the term love there. I would say that they're probably um, dealing with an obsession of some kind. Uh, you know, a life of measurement isn't a life at all. So 
How many times have I said this, folks? Uh, so let me say it again. While the, while the phrase, an unexamined life is not worth living, all right, is true, this is also true. The over-examined life is not really living at all. So um, sad for me to see when I was in Aruba, people tracking everything on their Fitbits and their, and their watches and their bands and, and just can't let go. I don't, I don't see how people could love living under that kind of microscope, putting themselves under that kind of pressure. That, that's not fitness to me. You know, so, um, yeah, and that's just my take. People can people can claim they love that. It's like, you know, I got a whole other thing prepared for next week's uh, breakfast with the coach about, because it's competition season here, I get so tired of the lady saying I love competing. That's bullcrap. You can't purchase pleasure with pain. Denying and, and depriving your body for months at a time to the point of exhaustion, to the point of such exhaustion, it'll take months to recover. No one can claim they love that. You might love the 10 minutes of attention you get on the stage and the five or six weeks of attention your body gets in the gym before you go on the stage, but you can't purchase pleasure with pain. That's never going to be a, a scenario that works out well. So, um, you know, that's just a side rant for me that people lie about things. So um, trying to glorify the competitive experience when it should be nullified, not glorified. Um, anyway, that's my opinion. People can argue on that. Um, uh, Monica, um, fave carbs or bread and pasta. I had a client like that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, a lot of the times you'll get clients, if you're a coach, you'll get clients who just want you to agree with them. You know, they hire you for a reason and then, it, and then they don't understand. You know, I had a client disgruntled with me, um, saying, well, you know, all this time, I don't think you've listened to me. Well, you know, then I present to the client, well, were, did I respond promptly? Yes. Did I respond to every point you had to make? Yes. Um, did I respond in detail to all your points? Yes. So what they didn't understand was, um, they're saying, oh, well, you didn't listen to me. Yeah, I listened to you. I just didn't agree with you. And that's why you pay me for my advice. So when people write me that they have friends that are doing, you know, uh, body by V or, you know, isogenics or whatever new thing comes down the line and they're getting great results. M my response is then go with them, you know, but don't think that I'm going to just uh, bop on the latest bandwagon when I've been in this industry for four plus decades. Um, you know, I know what works long term and I'm after the long term results. So, um, you know, that's, uh, that's what matters. I wish more people had respect for people who have decades of experience in any industry because there you're going to get the real deal of nuance. There's probably, when I'm dealing with a client, there's probably a hundred things going on beneath the surface that are automatic to me that I don't need to think about anymore because they're just that automatic after decades of experience and people can't relate to that um, because they're so busy with Google searches and trying to um, you know, dismantle contradictory information. I don't have to do that when I know what works after four decades. So, um, Alice, oh, you liked physique after 50. Perfect. Uh, by all means, Alice, please leave us a review and a, and a, and a star rating, uh, really helps, uh, helps the cause. So, um, yeah, I appreciate that immensely. So, uh, what's, what's my view on the whole bulletproof trend? Um, oil, butter, butter and coffee. Oh yeah, I've started seeing that stuff. Uh, putting MCT oils in coffee and all that. Mm, meh. Another gimmick to make someone sound like they know more than you do. Um, you know, I'm just a simple old bastard. So, you know, I say simplicity. And even Einstein said, the truth is simple and simplicity is the truth. So what you get here is you get a lot of wannabe up and comers who are trying to reinvent the wheel. Whereas the folks that have been around the longest, we're just trying to make a better wheel. So, um, you know, um, yeah, I just, um, I don't buy into a lot of that crap because it's incidental. The problem in this industry, folks, is that the wannabes try to present what's incidental as if it's instrumental. And then they lack such education and experience that they don't even see that what's in instrumental they reduce to being incidental. So they'll go on and on to you about fasted cardio, but they understand nothing about 
how a starvation state will keep you up at night and disrupt your sleep in a way that will harm your health and your and your appearance. So this is the kind of thing I'm meaning, confusing what really matters with what really doesn't. So uh, those are kind of, that's kind of the thing there. My views on the whole recovery model and training, increasing volume via time, uh, sets, reps, times weight, structured with individualized mesocycles into a macro cycle with incorporating deload recovery weeks. Well, that's a lot of industry mumbo jumbo there, Andrea. And, and that can be fine for someone who's in the strength world who has to peak to lift a certain weight. But if you're in the physique, physique development world, physical transformation world, not a whole lot of that matters. You should be doing, instead of constantly measuring the client, you should be constantly assessing objectively the client. Those things don't involve numbers. All right, they involve knowing your client and looking at their biofeedback. That's why clients check in with me. And when clients who don't know anything about me, they'll ask the first couple check-ins, should I be writing down the weights I use? And should I be telling you, you know, should I weigh in every day? Can I send you progress pictures every week? No, 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 and more no. All right, I'm trying to get the inside out perspective. You can't measure that. You can only assess and observe it. All right, and that's why the client becomes as, a, as an important a source as anything else. So be careful of coaches and trainers who want to measure everything, who want to have you on a weight scale and put a tape measure around your waist and all the other yucky poo poo, stinky caca nonsense. All right, um, be wary of, of people like that. They don't know what they're doing. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Bulletproof. I mean, pfft. Look at the term there, Monica. I mean, bulletproof. I mean, as soon as you see terms like that, it just turns me off. You know, ooh, I'm a bulletproof fitness. It's the same thing with the sort of people that this industry attracts, right? Like um, on the deeper level, we see um, ladies in this industry attract competing. Ladies with severe body image issues and eating disorders attract to the stage as a way to legitimize uh, their obsession and compulsion with body image and eating disorders. On the other side, on the lighter side, we see on the male side a superhero complex with everyone walking around with Batman and Superman tattoos and things like that. It's the things I've never really understood. Um, I was more from the Bob Paris school where as physique sculpting was sort of an artistic form uh, that you could create. It had nothing to do with how macho you are or you aren't. So, um, you know, macho is as macho does. Uh, if someone needs to stamp macho mentality into the physique transformation world, I think it reflects a certain level of self-esteem. Um, I don't know. I never, I never understood that. So uh, <laughs> that's just me. That's just one of my things there. Um, uh, what do I think of Amit pro products, uh, Joe Rogan's company? It's just stop. I mean, I don't really know or care who Joe Rogan is. Um, anything that's that's a product, a supplement that you swallow, that's all to increase the size of the marketer's wallet. I haven't seen or heard or looked at any research in all my years that merits me taking part in the supplement world. As a matter of fact, if you look at people who aren't selling the supplements and who have no horse in the race, you won't see a lot of support for, for taking supplements. So um, I said this the other day. Look, I said this on my podcast the other day. I've been at the top of this industry for four decades. I was a paid, a paid endorsed athlete in the magazines. I ghost wrote for the supplement companies, ghost wrote for the magazines. Listen, folks, I had all kinds of offers from the people who made supplements that if I believed in any supplements would benefit the consumer, I would be a multimillionaire many times over now. All right, I didn't see it. What I saw was a lot of scamming of the consumer, um, and I've yet to see a supplement that works. Do you really think if there was a supplement out there that works and my connections in the industry, I would be so lazy as to not get involved in that? Of course I would mass market that along with uh, my name, my name being huge 10, 15 years ago, I would have been a multimillionaire, but I just couldn't, um, you know, reconcile myself to taking advantage of people who were looking for an edge. The real edge is in coaching. The magic is in the method, not in a pill you swallow. And, you know, I wish people would get that. They attack me when I say supplements don't work, save your money and pay for expertise, pay for coaching. And yet if they understood the backstory there of my background, 
I could have easily been a millionaire 10 times over. I had the people who manufactured the supplements for Muscle Tech and Next Care approach me and say, you've got a big name, you write for these people, let's do your own supplement line, we'll promote you, uh, blah, 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 we'll use your name, sign here, you know, and, and we're talking large money, and I never did it. Um, because there's no, I mean, I just, I couldn't sleep at night if I was just uh, lining my pockets at the expense of ripping off the consumer. I would rather be an expert uh, trying to help. And it's funny how that backfires later on because people need to and want to believe in magic. So, um, Kristen, did I miss you talking about gluten? You sure did. Um, uh, you're going to have to uh, rewatch this. I'll post it later. Uh, basically, I just, I'm going to post a study, Kristen, that shows that uh, gluten intolerance is a lot of nonsense. If you don't have celiac, then gluten is a non-issue. That's the bottom line. Um, period, exclamation point, uh, end of story. So uh, hopefully um, you'll come back and, and you'll listen to all that and read the study. I'll post, I'll post the link uh, in the comment section after I post this. So, um, Hey, Andrea, no, I mean, controversy with metabolic damage, it's not controversial to me. Um, a lot of the research shows no damage per se, but it's not research in this industry. In the end, if you look at the recent study on Biggest Loser contestants, it definitely 100% shows metabolic damage. And that's in my, um, my podcast, Smarter Sculpted Physique, one of the first few episodes we talked about uh, metabolic damage. And if you look at... Um, if you look at the work of Diana Swartzbean, which I've used several times on YouTube, you can find, you can find um, stuff from her. She uses the term metabolic damage over and over. Now, she only has 25 years experience in endocrinology and internal medicine, so I guess she can't be believed either. We should believe some fitness, you know, bro science guy uh, who says metabolic damage doesn't exist. If you want to fight over terminology, whatever, but I wrote a book, Metabolic Damage and the Dangers of Dieting, because it warranted a book from everything I saw and witnessed. So don't forget, I trained competitors for four decades, and I saw what happened, especially to female bodies, when all hell breaks loose metabolically. So of course it exists. And again, look in the right places for the answers. Diana Schwartzbein, 25 years internal medicine, board certified. 25 years endocrinology, all right? That's where you look. These are experts on metabolism, and she uses the word uh, damage metabolism, metabolic damage, over and over again. And she uses it in the context of vil um, vilifying key things like insulin and, and understanding this whole idea of, of calorie burning and always always burning out the body and the damage that, that causes metabolically and hormonally over time. So people just aren't going to the right sources. They go to their their fitness source, their bro source, all right? And, and instead of looking to track where the actual expertise comes from, these people don't have any interest in fitness and cosmetics. So of course, they're you're not going to find them if you're not looking outside the industry, but that's where to look. So hopefully that answered your question, Andrea. Uh, all right, are we uh, running out of comments and questions? If so, I'll continue with my own rants. Now, how many just want me to continue with some, my, some of my own rants? Because I wrote down a few. So, uh, and how's the picture, folks? Am I still doing okay? I'm not too high, too low. I'm still getting used to a phone here. And what about the sound? I meant to plug in my headphones and my... Uh, I didn't plug in my headphones. I totally forgot. So, <laughs> everything's good? Sounds good? Next time I will plug in my headphones and earphones. So uh, totally forgot that. Sorry, folks. Um, Cliff, thoughts on whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, thoughts on the theory of muscle gain through less weight, higher reps versus heavier weight. Um, well, I mean, you you have to. It's not about how much is on the bar. It's it's how taxing the load is on the muscle. So, um, you know, one of the lines I always use there, Cliff, is Bob Paris once said, if I can make five, if 300 pounds feel like 500 pounds on my muscle, that's my goal. Um, that's what we call an innervation training trick. Um, if you look at my book, The Able Approach, second edition, 
You'll see how I explain all of that. That heavy isn't how much is on the bar. Heavy is how much stress the, the muscle is under. So of course you need to do what we call surf the curve. And that just means uh, using um, a variation of rep schemes. Anywhere from sets of five uh, all the way up to 20, 25 plus. And then things like complexes like my quad blasts and things like that. So um, that's important as well. So... Um, What's for breakfast? Well, I just got back from Aruba, and since I just got back to my diet, I'm not I'm not really in the uh, full cycle diet mode yet, Monica. But I did have a big bowl of Harvest Crunch and uh, and uh, two thirds of a box of vanilla Rice Krispies for breakfast. Nothing exciting, but uh, by next week, I'm sure I'll be back in full mode. I know uh, my protege Andy wanted to take a drive with me yesterday to check out a bakery that had uh, Kelowna Cronuts, which is. Uh, a big thing here, all injected with vanilla cream and everything. But I just had two weeks of that, so um, it's gonna wait till till next time. So, um, what is the advice for women who want to slim down their legs? Is weight training enough? Well, it depends what you mean by slimming down your legs. The only way to slim down, if you're gonna train with weights, uh, you can lean up your legs, but they're not gonna slim down. The only way to really slim down legs and make them smaller is to do long distance running, but then you're going to have a skinny fat look. So the legs will be smaller, but um, they might not necessarily look better. So uh, Vita, if you want uh, a, a more athletic or a tighter look to your legs, I'm working on two projects now. You should check out my Ultimate Figure program, first of all. Um, it's targeted directly at women and their trouble spots. And we're working on... Uh, a train at home body weight glute product which will be ready soon which is all about you know for women I'm all about the the um, shape and tone and sculpt uh, effect um, shape and sculpt and tone and tighten um, so we're working on that specifically for the glutes and then we're working at a train at home um, project for busy women uh, that involves minimal equipment that will uh, accomplish the same thing so it's always in the programming beta that's the important thing so um, that's the important thing to consider. What time frame would you recommend for bulking cutting cycles? Well, this is the thing again, Sarah, people with the outside in approaches, um, without paying attention to their biofeedback, you can't induce change in your body on time schedules and think your body's just going to respond to that. Your body responds in its own way, in its own time. And it takes someone to read the biofeedback of that. Uh, to determine. For one, I don't necessarily believe in bulk and cutting cycles. A lot of people don't need them. Some do, most don't. Um, but when you're talking about that, once again, you're usually talking about people who aren't from the physique transformation world like I am. They're from the strength world, so they're they're uh, imprinted with periodization schemes. But, you know, just because you do strength training for four weeks doesn't mean your body's done with that or has adopted to that or has had enough of that. So, you don't assign time frames outside in illusion of control time frames. You start a process and you uh, assess objectively how your body is adopting to that process and then you determine the length of time accordingly. Now, if a program is written correctly, most of my programs last 16 weeks because the the periodization is built into it, so we don't have to worry about four-week cycles and all this stuff. And it's nonsense. If you understand how the body adopts, it's nonsense to say, you got to change your training every four weeks. Actually, if you're familiar with my work, I always tell people it takes at least seven, eight, nine weeks just to get to the mastery phase of a program. And it's in the mastery phase where the greatest adaptive response happens. The mastery phase is where you no longer have to think about what you're doing. It becomes more automatic. And in that, you get greater mind-muscle connection. And it can take weeks to build up to that. So, um, yeah. Uh, let me go. Uh, da, da, da. All right. We've got some people who are doing ultimate figure already. What are my thoughts on does overtraining obliques create a masculine look for women? Of course it does. Uh, I don't know any women out there who want thicker hips, bigger butts, and a wider waist. I just don't meet very many of them. Now, if they're in the competitive strength world, sometimes that's a benefit, but I'm not in that world. So 90% of my stuff is oriented at, at women who want to shape and sculpt, tighten and tone. Um, so I don't believe in certain things like uh, weighted hip thrusts and and things like that, and dumbbell bends. Um, really, 
Uh, that's a good question. Um, who just asked that? Um, Christina, we just released a product this week, Abs by Andy, what we call uh, uh, in the family the AAA product, Andy's Awesome Abs. You can find that absbyandy.com and check that out. And there's a whole segment in there on, on why and how Andy avoids heavy oblique work for him. And he's a cover model. And he stays away from that stuff. So uh, women should stay away from it too. Especially if you have a natural hourglass figure like most women are meant to. Wide in the pelvis, wide in the hips for childbearing. Uh, a little narrower in the, in the clavicles. Then why would you want to accentuate that look with even wider obliques? That would just make you even look more pear-shaped. So um, this is the benefits and the, and the greatness of physique transformation training that I like where you can sort of shape and sculpt and create illusions with the physique. That's, that's what I love doing. Um, that's my niche. I don't really care about, you know, getting someone to bench press 50 pounds more. That's never really appealed to me. Um, yeah, so uh, do I feel that sticking to staple foods is ideal? Uh, there's the whole theory that your body develops sensitivities when, oh, please. Yeah, yeah, I, I've eaten the same foods for over 30 years. Maybe that's why I'm so hard to look at. Uh, you know, I've developed all these sensitivities and they've turned me into Quasimodo or something. I, I just, again, a bunch of fitness nonsense. Eat the same thing and develop an allergy to it. And, you know, very little true evidence to that. Um, so, yeah. Um, yeah, and, and, you know, whatever. I mean, that works for you, Tracy, to eat the same foods during the week and change it up on the weekend. I know Andy does stuff like that as well. I tend to be a creature of habit. I don't like thinking about food except for when it's the refeed day because then it's a fun factor. So I just keep my diet the same, easy for my housekeeper to make every week, and it allows me to get on with the things I want to get on with. So, um, yeah. Oh, Mike, you got the Abs by Andy program. Hmm. And you love it? Okay, good. By all means, please send us a testimonial and a star rating and... Uh, We'll get that off. Send that to uh, Mike at scottablefitness.com. We'd we'd love that. Um, yeah, it's blowing up online. Abs by Andy. You get to see cover model, um, a real fitness uh, supermodel cover model. You get to see him in the kitchen explaining his meals, making his meals. And you get to see no gimmicks, right? You get to see a guy with eight-pack abs year-round who eats carbs and does no cardio. I mean, that's what I'm saying, folks. The magic is in the method. So uh, that's the important thing. So what I, I, if, if you don't mind, folks, I'm going to finish with some uh, lessons from Aruba. Every year I go to Aruba. I shared some of that with my Facebook uh, followers earlier in the week. And I just wanted to sort of do some summations of things I saw. Now, the first thing is about me in particular that I wanted to share with people who are hardworking and stuff. Now, I'm, um, if you don't mind, just hold the comments for now and... Um, wanted to get these things out there. We were going to do it in a podcast, but my boss said, nah, that's not podcast stuff. So, oh, okay. I got to, uh, he cracks a mean whip, folks. So, anyway, the first thing I notice, I know I'm a pretty chilled guy. I live alone. I live in solitude. I love it. So I live in a, a natural environment. Um, so I'm more chilled than most people are. I don't answer to a boss. I have no time. You know, I don't have, uh, you know, time restraints or, or, or deadlines or things like that. So I'm already more chilled than most people. And when I go to Aruba, it amazes me every year the amount of unconscious, subconscious tension that I build up. So I'm in the airport in Toronto waiting for my flight to Aruba. It's a little bit late, not a big deal. But I notice how, you know, agitated I was by that. And I get to Aruba and I'm standing in line at the hotel waiting to get my room. And I'm agitated by how slow the lineup's going. Now, I go every year. So this is something that happens every single year. And it's amazing. I get checked in. I go for a walk on the beach. And it's amazing how much time it takes to decompress from daily life. And I think that's always a good lesson to share because I'm less wound up than 90% of the people I know. And I talk to people in Aruba about this. It's amazing how many people I talk to that go back every year. And the people have been going as long as I have, 20 plus years, how all of them go for extended periods. And here's the thing when people will say, well, I'm only here for a week, but I wish it was more. And the reason is it takes two or three days, folks, to decompress. And only then 
are you really in that mode where you're rebooting yourself and rebooting your system spiritually, mentally, emotionally, letting that stuff just leave your body? Um, it takes a few days to unwind. And then what these people find is they've only got into that unwind mode and then it's time to think about packing and returning home. So I'm pretty chilled as it is. And every year I'm amazed by just how much um, tension I have below the surface till I get to Aruba and it sort of uh, just comes out of me. So um, people who don't take vacations or, you know, um, have... Uh, different modifications of vacations. For instance, myself, I never understood the cottage when I lived back east. People would line up in in three, four hour traffic to go to a cottage for two days just to line up back in three or four hour traffic to go home. And, and by the time they decompressed at the cottage, then they get all wound up and tense because of the traffic jams going back home. So they never really got to um, get the benefit of that recharge and reboot. So just something to consider. If you don't take vacations, you really should uh, be thinking about the cost of that below the surface. So, um, so yeah, very, very important stuff. Um, the second thing is I really, really um, saw just how much consequences there are, folks, to what I call balloon people. People who are, are not just overweight, but very overweight. And I saw them on the beach, um, you know, in their t-shirts and just sweating and dumping sweat and looking unhealthy. And most of them like sitting in the hotel uh, lounges rather than out by the pool or out by the beach because their bodies just couldn't handle it. They actually at Aruba have mobiles for truly handicapped people like uh, people in wheelchairs and things like that that will now go up and down the beach. And they were actually experiencing more of Aruba then the balloon people that I saw who were uh, just constantly sweating and and that made me think, you know, uh, those are the ones I saw who were there. Imagine the ones who wouldn't even venture to go there because they don't fit in the um, airplane seats and things like that. So just how limiting it is to not take care of your body and then you get to a point um, where you can no longer take care of your body and the consequences of that, um, the less... Um, you know, the, the less amount of life you have in your years. Um, and that's sad to see. So I, I witnessed a lot of that big, big people and the limitations they had because of that. So that was um, sad. And then I saw the same old cardio nonsense that I see every time I go to Aruba. If I have to use the hotel gym, I run in there and there's people... <laughs> you know, on the treadmill or on the elliptical when they could be outside on the beach. I and mean, that, that makes no sense to me. But they're there because they think they have to count their calories burned and all that stuff. Uh, meanwhile, just down the, the road from me, um, uh, just a, a beach walk away is a functional trainer, uh, uh, like a functional training system put in on the beach, which I posted about, um, showed you all you guys. And here's these people walking in air conditioning on the treadmill or doing the elliptical why not go out and walk the beach? It makes no sense. Plus, they would experience what we call uh, situational hypermetabolism. Situational hyper hypermetabolism is when your body's suddenly in a climate change and has to adopt. You get a metabolic bump from that. When I come from a cold climate and go to a very, very hot one, my body has to instantly adopt to that. So that increases my metabolism exponentially right away. Now, that's a labile thing. It doesn't last but it certainly benefits. That's why I, I go there on the cycle diet. I don't worry about what I eat. I eat whatever I want. And when I come back every single year, people say I look leaner, even though if you knew what I ate, um, that you would think that that wouldn't be possible. So I also uh, experienced what's called reverse metabolic shift. Now, this is really important. In reverse metabolic shift, uh, what happens um, I, the reason this is relevant, the first time I went to Aruba, or, or the first day in Aruba, my tradition is I go to Ruth Chris Steakhouse. Um, it's my favorite place, and it just sort of make, makes my mind know that I'm in Aruba. And I left there the first night. Whoa, was I full. I mean, I was full. I had to go, you know, walk up and down the strip just to, and, and like, whoa, I am full. All right. But the second time I went to Ruth Chris... I left there and I could have eaten some more, even though I had the exact same meal. And this is what we call reverse metabolic shift. And here's why it's important. As I ate 
more and more junk and more and more stuff off my diet and didn't have regular meal times, my metabolism shifted toward adopting to that. So that the second time I went to Ruth Chris Steakhouse, the same amount of food didn't fill me up like beyond comfortable like, like the first one did, even though it was the exact same meal. So my metabolism shifted to adopt to that. And we call that reverse metabolic shift because what happened, uh, what happens to most dieters, people who come to me for a weight loss diet, that works in reverse. So they're not used to regular meal times or eating a certain way. When you put them on a regimen, they tend to feel uh, hungrier, all right, and they have more cravings. Their appetite is higher because they're going through metabolic shift the other way. Their body is now adopting to eating better foods, good foods. That increases intestinal motility. That sends new messages to the hypothalamic uh, access that, that regulates hunger and satiety, and we call that metabolic shift, and that can take anywhere from 9 to 17 days in someone where they're just writing, I'm not eating enough calories, um, you know, I, I don't feel right. And, you know, that's what we call metabolic shift. And then two weeks, you know, after that, if they've hung with it, they're like, oh, the, suddenly the food feels like enough now. Um, so we call that metabolic shift. And I experienced that in reverse because I diet for a living. So that was an interesting, um, you know, lesson that I can share with people. So life is always offering us lessons, our jobs to pay attention. The other thing uh, with that um, is how easy it is to come back when you're a regimented dieter, how easy it is to come back and get on my diet. Uh, I look forward to it. And um, the thing there is the first couple days back on the diet because of that metabolic shift, I was extra hungry all day, hungrier than I normally am before vacation. And, but with my experience, I knew that would go away, and it has already. Uh, but the other thing is how much I crave the regu the regimentation again, just wanting to be back on the diet, but was definitely hungrier going back to it. So that's another lesson to learn about metabolic shift. The other thing there is being a foodie in Aruba is the diet psychology. I reverse things more than most people, especially women. Uh, I get a lot of women who want to diet for their vacation to look better on vacation. I've written about this uh, a million times. You know, no stranger you're going to meet on the beach in a place like Aruba is going to know you just lost 20 pounds or 15 pounds. So you're doing it for your own self-esteem reasons. And then you try to get there and stay on your diet. I've seen couples fighting over this while they're in Aruba. But I go the other way in terms of understanding diet psychology. Um, what I try to do in Aruba is gain as much weight as I can. My goal is to literally come back as a big fat fatty. That's what I try to do. I mean, I even kept saying that all the time on the beach. I'm a big fat fatty. Um, and that's my goal. Diet psychology wise, because I understand metabolism, any weight that I gain is going to be labile. All right. It's not going to last. It's not sustainable. Um, you know, it's unstable. So that way, when I come back, unlike most people who I've coached who go away on vacation and try to diet, when I come back, I totally indulge. So there's no deprivation in my head, diet psychology wise. There was no denial in my head, diet psychology wise. So therefore I have all the motivation in the world to get back to my regimentation of cycle diet. Whereas I see so many people who try to diet there and have frustration there because they see good food, they don't have an ice cream cone, they don't have this, they don't have that. They come back and those feelings of deprivation and denial of pleasure lead to closet eating once they're home from their vacation. So the vacation actually caused a disruption in their regimentation because of faulty diet psychology, right? A time for every purpose under heaven, folks. So that's a very important thing as well. Along those lines, one of the things I noticed too as well is um, here we are at the airport and uh, waiting, waiting to fly back to Canada and we're sitting in a bar area, well, bar slash restaurant area, sitting down, chatting with other tourists, all getting ready to board the plane. And um, I had a couple big honking slices of pizza in front of me, and I was already drinking beer, and I had a big piece of carrot cake. And people were asking, you know, what do you do for a living? The typical conversations that you get. And um, so they were looking me up on Amazon and my books and everything. And then one of the, one of the, the men said to me, 
if you eat, if I see you eat that pizza and carrot cake, I'm buying all your books. And it, that's, you know, ironic to me because it's representative of the, the diet mentality, right? That somehow I have to be some kind of orthorexic looking for my gluten-free, you know, fat-free, whatever, in an airport, in a bar, and stressing out. So um, it's always uh, ironic to me comments like that because I think, well, what, I, I, I bought two pieces of pizza and a carrot cake because I'm not going to eat them. I just want to pretend I'm going to. But as part of the cycle diet, I know that eating that isn't going to negatively impact me cosmetically. That I'll probably even look better. So um, that's part of understanding the metabolic adaptation process, right? So that's always a, a comment. I get that every year that, oh, you don't actually eat that. Oh, yeah, I do. Um, I don't eat it all the time. But uh, so that was a good lesson, too. Um, and then, yeah, that, and, and funny, ironically, I'm a morning person. And when I'm in on the beach in Aruba, one of the other things I noticed as well, being the morning, that the people who are up in the morning tend to all be over 40. And that's just a sort of social commentary. I think you get to a point where um, that sort of happens in general at a certain age. So, uh, you know, I, I walk along and I remember thinking, there's no young people out here. Uh, you know, because it's like six in the morning, right? And we're out walking the beach and you don't see anybody under 40. Um, you know, and we're out getting our coffee and chatting with people. And it's just such a more uh, laid back vibe then comes later in the afternoon when the youngsters get out and they're all on their jet skis and they're all in groups and nothing wrong with that it's just a, a social observation so uh, that was another thing um and then of course the other was discovering glenn arthur shout out to uh, glenn arthur young lad from venezuela working personal training in the gym in aruba which is a shame because he's got a one in a million physique that should be making huge amounts of money online for the way he works out, how he works out, his sparkling personality. So you can find diamonds in the rough anywhere and a bit of a language barrier, but I sure would like to help the lad out and maybe do a project with them. Works hard, smiling all the time, laughing all the time, just a, a general got it right. Not walking around with the ILS syndrome, the imaginary lat spread, not walking around with a macho bullshit attitude, just happy and smiling and laughing and yelling and screaming and it was funny when we got back uh, here and went to my normal gym um partner said to me wow the vibe in here is so like depressing comparatively speaking and it's like yeah very conservative uptight you know uh compared to a place where everyone's high-fiving and saying hi and loving the life and things like that so um yeah so those are just some minor lessons from aruba we can always follow them up uh, anytime. I always t tend to come away from Aruba with a lot of lessons. Uh, if you look back um, a few days ago, I posted the other one of what transpired at Dunkin' Donuts with, with uh, two other big fat fatties that I like to say, um, who were one, one overweight lady was shaming another one, which just made me shake my head beyond belief. Uh, so I had to comment on that as well. Um, but there's always lessons to be offered. And, um, yeah, I just, you know, uh, we started out with the whole debunking of gluten again, debunking, uh, um, marketing myths. So, uh, yeah, um, Hakuna Matata, I'll come up with something better than that. <laughs> uh, okay, so everyone's back to their questions then. Um, uh, Andrea, I love answering your questions, but you can't hog all the, you can't hog all the time, my friend. <laughs> You're going to have to become a client. You've got a book full of great questions. I could do a project with the questions you're, you're asking me. But they're all in. Most of my, the answers are in most of my uh, products. So I'm going to skip that one since I'm running out of time. So uh, Alice is saying you enjoyed watching me and Glenn working out together. Yeah, that was a Facebook Live thing. You know, um, you know it was uh, the old guy leading the way and, and holding my own. So uh, that, was, uh, that was pretty good. So... Um, yeah, unless there's anything else, folks, I'm glad to be back to Sunday Breakfast with the Coach. Uh, got my phone working the right way, I think. I think you guys are happy with the sound and the picture. Next time I'll remember to put in the headphones, but this is my first time working with a phone, so hopefully I did okay. Um, so yeah, the title of this one, of course, is um, Debunking uh, um, Gluten Intolerance and Lessons from Aruba. 
and all your other um, you know uh, questions and answers so I appreciate the hearts and the thumbs again Facebook really likes them um, there's some shenanigans going on with Facebook I would love to explain but uh, it would take us in a different direction and I could get punished <laughs> by Facebook for explaining them so I won't but uh, anyway um, yeah the the thumbs and the uh, and the uh, hearts, I appreciate folks because Facebook likes them and then that, that enhances my reach on Facebook. So just telling you how it is. My ego doesn't need them, uh, but Facebook sure likes them. So uh, yeah, lots of comments, uh, folks. I, I suggest um, you read all these comments after I post the show uh, online and then again on my YouTube channel. Um, so I appreciate you being here. If you weren't there, it wouldn't make a whole lot of sense for me being here. And uh, I appreciate all of the comments, folks. Um, so, yeah, remember, if you're coming on here, you're not going to find a whole lot of support for supplements from this guy. I don't see it um, anywhere. Otherwise, I'd be selling them myself. Why wouldn't I be? I'd be a fool not to. But I'm not going to sell something to make money at the expense of, of ripping people off. I just can't sleep doing that. And, and that's not my... I believe in the coaching. I believe in expertise and paying it forward. Uh, in that sense, you should check out my protege's project he did with me, uh, Andy Sinclair, Real Andy Sinclair on Instagram, and the project is absbyandy.com. We call it the AAA Project. Um, Andy's awesome abs. Uh, someone who keeps an eight-pack abs year-round, um, you know, for cover shoots and things like that, and he does it as a lifestyle, no gimmicks, no dieting just for the photo shoots or the videos, just look like that all year-round. But eats carbs and does no cardio and so no gimmicks so check that out absbyandy.com we got way more coming we got the um, body weight glute training project with the lovely Krista coming up uh, and then we got two more huge projects another one specifically for women coming up and then in the new year uh, if these other projects are done by there or late this year I'm starting on a food issues course as well so uh, that should be pretty good so Anyway, folks, I appreciate the, the great comments. By all means, please uh, read them when you're done. Um, some of them are too embarrassing for me to read because they're so supportive. I uh, don't want to pat myself on the back too much. Um, but yeah, okay, folks. Um, appreciate all the thumbs and the hearts and the, the yellow happy faces and the rest. And hopefully you learned something here. And if you have questions, get them ready for next week's uh, Sunday Breakfast with the Coach because I'm back. See you later.